This was the most successful movie of the 50s popular. I watched this a lot growing up. You will find my top 10s, recaps on legacies, an occasional photo or two and of Maleficent. The Mistress of All Evil, which will be a sequel to the 2014 spin-off movie Maleficent. That film was a semi-remake of Disney's animated 1959 classic Sleeping Beauty, but with a titular villain in the leading role, as opposed to the princess. Speaking personally, I had no desire to see Maleficent, I don't plan on ever watching it, and I certainly don't care to see its theatrical sequel either. It did still leave me wondering why Disney didn't just remake Sleeping Beauty and Live H in the same way they eventually did with both Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast. Was it an attempt to try something new while also tying in with a familiar Disney product, or was the original just not good enough in the eyes of the studio? Either way, it's got me rekindling the flames of nostalgia for the original, and what better time to talk about it than prior to the release of its second live action spin-off. Sleeping Beauty was the studio's 16th animated feature film, and for me, I always viewed it as the cap to a figurative trilogy that began with Disney's animated 1937 classic Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and continued with 1950's Cinderella. These were the original three princess tales, brought to us from Walt Disney himself, and while more animated princess would populate the studio's animated works, these would remain the three classic girls that started it all. Back when I was just a little boy, I surprisingly found myself drawn to these three animated films more so than the other films of the studio and I remember Sleeping Beauty was my absolute favorite to watch as a kid. Our enchanted tale begins with the birth of a princess and a wicked witch who prophesied that her death was to take shape in 16 years. Fearing for her daughter's life, the king and queen of the land entrust their little girl's life to the caring hands of three fairy godmothers. Years later, the princess grows up and falls in love with a handsome stranger, unaware that he's the very prince she's been betrothed to from birth. Just as a magical ending seems on the horizon, the evil Maleficent makes her move by putting the fair princess in a death-like sleep, along with the whole kingdom. She then locks the prince away in her dungeon, where she plans to keep him for several years until he becomes a withered old man upon which she'll release him to be reunited with his love, as a miserable old figure. In short, the strength of the film comes from the experience, while the narrative structure is admittedly very weak. Rather than tell a flowing story, with character arcs or morals, the film is primarily built on individual scenes. Like as the scene when our two leads fall in love upon meeting for the first time, here's the scene with the fairy's goofy antics, and here's the scene when the villain takes command, and it's all kind of one note. However, the film isn't about channeling emotions through a gripping narrative, it's all about the emotions felt through the things we experience as the film unfolds. There's no sense beating around the bush, so let's just jump right into the main attraction of the movie The Villain. Maleficent's popularity has basically led her to be the flagship villain of the animated Disney franchise. I think every countdown of classic Disney villains would feature Maleficent securely ranked among the top three absolute best and for good reason. While previous animated bad guys could stand out as highlights, Maleficent marked the first time a villain completely stole the show, and actually stood out as my favorite character in the whole film. Something I didn't even notice as a kid was that her screen time was very limited, and she didn't dominate the scenery until the third act. It's a perfect case of a villain never overstaying their welcome, yet still leaving a memorable impression. She has such a cool design, with a long purple and black cloak, a long cape that resembles flames, bat-like wings coming from the neck, a green face, and double horns. Even her name is awesome, so it's definitely in a plus with the presentation. Another strong element in play is that Maleficent combines both quiet, sophisticated evil with monstrously dominant evil. In other words, she can attack you both mentally and physically, which is the perfect combination for a classic villain. Of course, I have to mention that Walt Disney himself insisted that no other actors voice Maleficent other than Elena Rodley, who had previously voiced the evil stepmother from Cinderella. It was absolutely the right call as the actress knows how to highlight both the subtlety and over-the-top elements of the character. Her wicked laugh is the stuff of legend like one of the all-time most identifiable evil laughs. With all my initial praise given to the villain, I certainly don't want to undermine my feelings for the fairy godmothers, as they too have a secure spot among my favorite Disney characters. While the film was initially in production, their only character traits were the individual red, green and blue colors in their designs. Thankfully, the writers decided to give them some added dimension, like individual personalities that would bounce off each other, and make them just all around delightful characters to have on screen. Despite being infectiously lovable, I'd go even further to call them the main heroes for the movie. These are the characters who come up with all the plans, share the most emotional moments, take the most action, have the most layer dark, and likewise share the lengthiest amount of screen time with any other characters in the film. 
While still marketed as supporting players, I still view them as the main legs, and I think it makes for a refreshing change to see three middle-aged women as the stars of a children's animated picture. Now, let's talk about our leading female protagonist. Oh boy, this is one issue with the film that's only gotten worse with age. Despite being my childhood favorite princess-themed Disney movie, this has always been my least favorite leading girl. Just to spotlight how boring and one note this princess is, people in general never refer to the character by her name which is Princess Aurora, who's also colorfully nicknamed Rose by her guardians. Still to this very day, everyone I know refers to her as Sleeping Beauty, even though that's only the movie's title, and has nothing to do with the character's name. Yeah despite the popularity of The Little Mermaid, audiences still refer to the film's princess by her name, Ariel, as opposed to referring to her as the title of the movie. There really isn't anything about Princess Aurora, or Sleeping Beauty, that makes her stand out, and the movie never gives me a reason to care for her. Say what you will about either Snow White or Cinderella, those movies at least got me to care about them on some level. I wanted to see Cinderella make a life for herself outside of that horrible house, and I was emotionally torn up after Snow White bit that poisoned apple. In the wake of Princess Aurora pricking her finger and falling into a sleep like death I never once felt a single thing for her. She didn't have much of a personality, and even her design was kind of generic although, I will say that I've always preferred her blue dress look over the pink attire. The heroic Prince Philip is about as boring, but to be fair, he's actually an improvement over the Prince characters featured in the earlier two Disney Princess films. Those two didn't even have names, none that I can remember anyway, nor did they speak more than two lines, and were mostly just reduced to silent cameos. So, Prince Philip was at least an attempt to add some dimension to the stereotype, but he still doesn't leave much of an impression. One detail that always bugged me was that, neither the prince or princess have many speaking lines after the middle part of the film. They are both consistently silent through the third act, and it makes them both feel like extras in their own movie. The one redeeming factor to these two is their shared song number Once Upon a Dream. Despite being a product of its time, this song still holds up on its own, and in my view was the most memorable romantic song from any of the original three Disney princess movies. Seriously, whenever I try to remember a romantic title from either of these three films, Once Upon a Dream is the first and only one that ever seems to come to mind. Outside of Once Upon a Dream, there really aren't any song numbers that stand out. There are choirs with lyrics heard throughout the film, but no other real songs. Regardless, the instrumental music heard through the film is outstanding, and it was lifted right from the famous ballet of the same name. In fact, this ballet music was Walt Disney's biggest influence on making the movie, and it's felt all throughout. It was George Bruns who composed the music, and his work on Sleeping Beauty won him the Academy Award for Best Film Score of the Year. Despite the movie's weak narrative, the technical experience of the picture remains one of Disney's strongest after all these years. Before I started writing this review, I made the conscious choice to watch this movie again on an old VHS tape, just to see how the animation looked without the polished Blu-ray enhancements. I'm happy to say that for an animated picture from 59, it's still one of Disney's absolute best-looking films to date. The designs, colors, backgrounds, artistry it just pops. The animators were inspired by tapestry work, or paintings you'd see in the medieval castle, and it's what characterized the overall look of the film. Future animated Disney movies like Pocahontas clearly drew a lot of influence from this film. I also love the design of Maleficent's castle grounds, as it feels reminiscent of Night on Bald Mountain, and maybe even an influence on the artwork seen in The Black Cauldron. Another ace up Sleeping Beauty sleep is that, in my opinion, it has some of the best atmosphere of any animated Disney project. Right from the start, I just feel like I'm breathing in the film's magical air, which further adds to some standout moments. One of my favorite individual scenes from any Disney picture is when the three fairy godmothers bless the baby with their gifts of beauty, song and hope. While the artistry on display is really something to admire for the time, what I really love is that the scene is presented with a sense of euphoria, almost like something you'd experience in a dream or meditative haze. Another small highlight I have to mention is the one cooking scene. It's hard to explain, but there's something instantly appealing about seeing ordinary household objects magically coming to life in an animated Disney picture. It's something that's so commonly present in other Disney works, to the point where it feels like a staple in their animated projects. If there was any one scene I always felt should have been axed from the film, it would be the needlessly long detour with the two kings and their bickering plans for their children's royal engagement. Oh, that scene always grinds the film to a halt, and I distinctly remember as kid, I'd always fast forward through that. The last highlight I have to address is that, after all these years, Sleeping Beauty still features my absolute favorite final battle of any animated Disney picture. 
It's kind of ironic that an early 1950s princess-themed Disney movie would feature my favorite climax, but that's why it's so special. One of the most classic staples of the fairy tale genre is seeing a prince ride off to rescue a princess who's locked in a tower, guarded by a fire-breathing dragon. That is the classic formula, and this is the classic final battle that set the template for sword-wielding heroes fighting monstrous foes. This finale isn't just epic for its presentation, but because it came from a time when animated pictures rarely featured anything of this size and level of excitement. Most animated films at the time would end on a very light and simple note, but this climax is just blazing with top-notch animation, lots of energy, and a thrilling musical score that keeps building and building. We get to see the fairies work their magic against attacking villains, we see the prince swing a sword, and of course we have the great villain showing off all her destructive power. The big showstopper, naturally is when Maleficent transforms into a giant, fire-breathing dragon. Kids today see stuff like this all the time, but this dragon battle still holds up very well, and I can't even begin to imagine how awesome this must have been for kids back in 1959, they must have been jumping out of their seats. Even as a grown adult, this finale still gets me thrilled. It may seem hard to believe, but Sleeping Beauty was actually one of the studio's biggest gambles, as well as one of the lengthiest productions that took nearly 10 years to finalize. The payoff was worth all the effort, as Sleeping Beauty turned out the second highest grossing film of 1959 behind Benner, which is some good company to be in. Over the years, it's remained an animated classic, although in the shadows of its two fairy tale predecessors. Personally, I feel the film is brought down by its rocky narrative structure, as well as featuring two of the weakest leading princess and prince characters. Had those two elements been touched up on, then the film would rank higher among my favorites of the studio's collective works. Still, the remaining strengths of the film, like the animation, the villain, the music, the fairies, the magical atmosphere, and the final battle all have secure spots among my favorite elements of any animated Disney picture so it's kind of challenging to rate this film. In the end, all I can say is I loved this movie when I was a kid, I've loved sharing this movie with my kids, and I think it holds up as a gem among Disney's animated works. If I had it my way, I'd say, ignore those two live-action spin-offs, unless you really want to see them entirely up to you, and just stick with the original classic. Thanks for reading my review of the 59 animated classic Sleeping Beauty, and continue to enjoy the movies you love.